Welcome to the Money Orchard Podcast. Investors have a problem. You don't want to lose money. You don't want to run out of money. You want your money to grow and you want a future free from financial worry. There are thousands of complex investments. Most of them fail. It's extremely difficult to know what will succeed. That's why Dennis turned financial language into a story that will change how you invest. You will see the financial world as clear as an in-focus photograph. It turns investment information into real financial knowledge that works. Hello and welcome to the Money Orchard with Dennis Zadaraka. Good morning, Dennis. How are you? Very good. Very, very early this morning. It's very early in the morning. <laughs> and it's snowing where I'm at. I'm, I'm assuming it's not snowing where you're at. It is not here. No, you're oh, right. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> I'm a little bitter about that this morning. <laughs> it's early and it's snowing. Uh, oh, boy. Okay. So, Dennis, what are we talking about this morning? Well, today I want to start talking about the three trees. Okay. The grow tree, the loan tree, and the protect tree. Uh, which are the the three major categories of where you can invest money, which if you're if you're a member represents Wall Street, the banks, and the insurance industry. Mm-hmm. But to, but we're today we're going to concentrate on the, I I call it the fun tree is the the grow tree mm-hmm. is uh, it is more fun than some of the other you know more tame those those sometimes are fun when things are going wild but. We're going to concentrate on one one tree uh, in the next podcast. We'll do do the uh, loan tree, and then the final final podcast we'll do the uh, protect, and really get into the idea of it's like protecting the orchard is as important as trying to grow it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably the biggest rule of investing is don't lose money. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. So I'm going to start off with you. Is ask you a question. All right. Do you tr- trust Wall Street? Mia, yeah, that's a big fat no. Okay. Why? Well, because they don't have my best interest in mind. That's what I would say. Any other reasons? <laughs> Track record. <laughs> I think. I think. Kind of looking at just the news in general, and and I mean, Wall Street is a very broad brush, you know, right? I mean, we talk about finances and everything, but yeah, I don't. I'm not going to just trust something blindly. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to do two things. One is the industry is you're right. I, I would agree with you. You're right about that is I think we sometimes forget the purpose of wall street is investment banking mm-hmm. is to raise money for companies, either through bonds, that's the loan tree or through stocks. Now you also can invest in real estate because the, you know, the, the builders, the apartment centers, the shopping centers, they have our REITs, R-E-I-T's. Mm-hmm. And that way you can invest in real estate through, again, going through the Wall Street firms. So they have a purpose, the purpose in the economy. And, you you know, as you said, their their, their main purpose isn't to, to, to help, you know, Dennis and Eric or anybody. Now, hopefully the two match up, that what they are doing, their job and what we need have some kind of overlap. But it's really our job uh, as investors to make sure is that, we're taking care of ourselves. They can take care of themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, the other one is why you don't trust Wall Street is not Wall Street's fault, fault, really. It's risky. Yes. It's dangerous. I mean, you can, people, not you can, people lose lots of money in, in by, by investing, by just doing, you know, the wrong things, dumb things. And sometimes what you thought was a good idea turns out to be, whoops, <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. So that would, that would be, you know, you know, I mean, there's really two factors to that. One is because it is risky. It's hard, you know, it's, it's, it's risky. But let me, let me shift gears then. So if you don't trust it, why do you put money in your 401k in those things? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a long story behind that, but I think most people put money in their 401k because that's what we're told to do, right? Oh, well, this is the retirement plan from the company and they're going to match, you know, a lot of companies will match a certain percentage or whatever. So it sounds like free money. So we, we just do that because it's also, you know, it's easier to not see it come out of our paycheck. We don't have to hand it over to anybody. It's just automatic. And and so it's, it's, it's so I, what I'm really driving at to get you, get you to realize that in spite of being scary and the fact that, that, you know, it's, you know, and maybe trust is not the right word. I'm trying to figure out what it is. It's just, you know, I'm, you know, 
I mean, some of it is I just don't blindly trust them. You're right. You're right. I, mean, I like your word. I don't blindly trust them. But there is something there that we can make money. Mm-hmm. It can work to our, you know, to our benefit. And so, you know, that's why we do it. There's lots of people who have done very, very well. Uh, my saving in whether it's a 401k or a mutual fund or a profit stream plan, you know, whatever they, whatever the format that they they've done that with. So, I'm going to add one other thing. This now the purpose of what I'm when we're talking about the own tree today. I'm not going to be able to give specific. Here's a good company to buy for mm-hmm. uh, for a number of reasons. Not one is by the time, this is December 2019, by the time somebody listens to this, maybe five years from now, things are going to change. Yeah. So so it's probably not a good idea. The, for another reason would be is I don't know who's listening, and maybe it's a good idea for you, but it's not a good idea for them. Mm-hmm. And so there's, the, there's that factor. We, you know, we want people to, you know, not, you know, make make mistakes. And then I think really the third reason is I really am trying to people not to be dependent on me, and I and I do that with my own my own clients is I don't want them to be tem- dependent on me. I don't want you or anybody to be dependent on anybody in the industry. I want you to be able to be able to say like, hey, I know what I'm doing. I um, mean, I I will take advice and guidance and get a second opinion, and I want to gather the information for wherever I can. But ultimately, I don't want to have people, oh, trust me, you're the professional. The, the people that, that would say that to me, the ones that, that scare me the most, mm-hmm. because they're assuming I know a lot more than I ever will, and they, assuming that anybody in the industry knows a lot more than they do. Yeah. So one of the things I would kind of like joking around saying, like, uh, you know, because the other one is, do you have any hot tips? Hmm. And I would say one is if I give you actually a real hot tip, we both go to jail if we get caught. <laughs> and the second thing is if I had any hot tips, do you think I'd be working anymore? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's it's just a, a matter of just, uh, I mean, really, the, the ultimate goal is that I want people to be able to be confident that they can make these decisions. They don't need a professional. and And if I do my job correctly, we then become a team working back and forth. Mm, all right. So let's, there's, okay, let's have, there's lots of things you can own. You can own, uh, you know, apartments, you can own land, you can own gold. Lot, there's lots of things to own. What we're really going to, when we talk about Wall Street, is kind of generically, because you can own through Wall Street all those things I talked about. Mm-hmm. But we're going to talk basically one of the first things that I would say as a rule is to, you want to find a good business. So instead of investing in stocks or the stock market, the real goal is I want to invest in a good business. Mm-hmm. And so, and that, and I, I remember um, this is going way, way back when. But vi- visited a, one, one of the things I did before I would start deciding, really getting excited about that I'm going to sell this particular mutual fund company. I actually went and visited the company's headquarters. Mm. And in one case, I did. I didn't like those people. I just got a creepy feeling about them. I'm not doing it. It turned out to be just pure instinct was turned out to be true. Then another one I went to, and I, I mean, was totally impressed. And and I mean, they've got a tremendous track record across all their funds. But I remember the guy, you know, the you know one of the major, you know, senior people of this says like, our company, we do not trade pieces of paper. We're looking to buy good businesses. And that is stuck in my mind, you know, for, you know, more than 30, 30 some years. And it's like, and it's, you know, it's good advice. I mean, when you stop and think about it, it's like, well, of course, you know, why is, why is that so complicated? Yeah. Well, one of the other things that I think that people make a mistake is too much, either not enough diversification, but in most cases, it's way over diversification. And I'm going to pick on the S and P just because it's 500 stocks. Is yes, you're diversified, but let's say 250 are good and 250 are bad. If you got your bottom 250 offsetting your top top 250, so maybe the way to beat the S and P is don't buy an index. You know, buy 400 of the 
the best ones and, and you can cut out the bottom or you can even make it, keep it going. It's like, why don't we just buy the best 100? Cause mm -hmm. 300, they gotta be going down or sideways. So that's one, one other application of it is trying to buy a good business is sometimes you just have to say, you know, this is an okay business, but it's not, you know, it's not dynamite. It's not, not the potential isn't as great as that. I want to put my money out, out, you know, at, at risk to see if I can make money because this one doesn't seem to be really growing or, you know, just, you know, plodding along, I guess is what I'd say. So how do you choose those top 100 then? Later on in the thing, I'm going to give you, a, we're going to talk about a, a direction in terms of, you know, how do, how do we do that? Okay. I think, a, I think, a, and, and, and what you just asked me, the question is, there's, you know, you're talking about anal finan I mean, what, you know, analysis of the company, balance sheets i mean we're gonna you're gonna weigh into the how do you how you do that but basically you want to see somebody's earning money making money second of all you want them hopefully they're making money and growing how much you know their income's growing and you know, it's a well-managed company mm -hmm. i'll give you another another factor and this is this was really the secret of um warren buffett is he essentially rather than just look at the numbers he looked at the management team. Yeah. Who are the people running this company? And you have people who are with tremendous talent is they're going to find, find a way to make money. Now there's not that many of them, but let's use an example, of, you know, probably the most famous, like Steve, Steve jobs, this guy, you know, was, I don't know if a creative genius or something, but he, he could make, you know, he took that company and just made all kinds of things that people didn't even know they wanted, but all of a sudden now I want them. Mm -hmm. So those are that one of the ways to get at that. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two historical examples. One is going back. Now we're going to go back to what, you know, late, late, or man, actually very early, not even late night, seven, seven, uh, 1970s, really kind of in the beginning of 1980s was when computers started coming along. And so you had Commodore and Sinclair and Gateway and what was the Dell and, you know, Compact and IBM. All, yeah. uh, and, and IBM was one. And now here's, now here's the funny thing out of all the ones, IBM is the one that didn't really make it. Mm -hmm. Now there's lots of reasons for that. And, and that me that not because they did it wrong. It's just AT&T had just got broken up. And uh, they th felt if they got too big in the PC area that they'd get broken up again. And so they kind of back, backed off of that. But rather than, I mean, and, and it was pretty, pretty easy to see, is that, hey, this is something big. There's something here. Mm -hmm. So the way to play it wasn't trying to guess who's the one that's, who's going to, they're, you know, they're outside of the box with their name on it. It's going to be the one that wins. If you looked at it, everybody had to have an Intel or an AMD chip. Basically, Intel. Yeah. Everybody had to have a Seagate hard drive. Everybody, now that kind of went away now, but, 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 um, but for a while, there, that's, and then everybody, even still there, everybody had to have an operating system. And that's Microsoft, Microsoft Word. I mean, so the way to really make money that way is buy the components of that. And whoever won the war in terms of marketing in the store, they still had to buy all the same components. So if you just bought Intel, you played the computer industry tremendously. So you didn't, and I would even make the case for it. So you didn't really have to be diversified amongst lots of stuff other than maybe owning AMD and Intel because which one's going to win, we probably didn't know that. Let me give you another example. Is This is, what would this be about 1986, uh, 1986 or 87. Marcos got deposed out of out of Philippines, and he'd been a dictator there for you know who knows how. I mean, I don't remember how long, but a long time. And all of a sudden, it looks like the economy, you know, the Philippines going to develop and be a you know a better place to invest than it, than it was. But rather than guess what's the company that's going to work, the way that actually I did it was I bought Philippine long distance because if the business and the economy and the businesses grew then the, they were going to use a lot more of the telephone. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, they're a little island, a bunch of them, actually, they're about 77,000 7, islands. 
but they're going to have to call all over the world to get this telephone, so they're going to be using the telephone more, and and so the economy is going to kind of represent, be represented by the telephone. And I didn't do this, but the other way to do that would be is you invest in the the major banks, because hmm. if the economy of that country is growing, those banks are going to grow. Yeah, true. So that's kind of a principle. Is you know you know narrowing it down. Now give you, let me give you the. I remember these numbers very well. I bought Philippine lost in the long distance at one dollar and three eight, one point three seven five. It went to ten, and hmm. I'm thinking, you know, and I, and I bought about ten thousand shares. It was only about ten thousand dollars. Yeah. So it went to it went to ten, ten, eleven, twelve, and I don't know with within there where I sold it, but I sold it somewhere. Let's say I had about a ten times. So I'm thinking I'm a you know a genius. <laughs> and I made money, so I mean I should be happy. But it went to forty. Ah, uh, no, was it a mistake? It's hard, hard to argue that you know maybe it was going to go back down. So hard to argue that. But if looking backwards, what I would what I would do is I would sell half, mm-hmm. take you know take a significant profit off of that, and let the other part run. Yeah. So when you so and going this is all going back to your question, how do you find the good business? Some of it is just thinking like these kinds of things. Yeah. Now, the other hand though is if you're going to use a manager, I like to look for managers that aren't doing an, an indexing, passive investing, wrap accounts, and we'll get into that a little bit. You know, take tear, kind of I guess tearing them apart a little bit. I want to have a manager that's that's doing the hard work of going out and re- researching and trying to find good businesses. I would like to somebody have, they try to invest in high conviction stocks. Their portfolio might only be 25 to 50 stocks, mm-hmm. but they're high conviction. What do you mean by high conviction? Well, one way, one of the ways that the manager finds those is they go hire a money manager and say, you know, let's say, and let's say he's a mutual fund manager. And so they say, listen, we don't want to give you the money to manage the portfolio, but we want to pay you for your ideas. What are your 25 best choices? Got it. Okay. Because, you know, after that, I mean, I mean because some of these funds are, you know, 50, 100 million, excuse me, 50, 100 billion dollar funds, they can't be real concentrated just by, by the laws. They can't really, I think they don't think. Most of them can't go over five percent. So if they get too big, then they got to start d- selling that down. So, but as an individual investor, I don't, I don't have the room that I got to have three hundred, four hundred, five hundred stocks in the portfolio. Yeah. So that with what they go to say, we want to know your, and then the other thing they ask them is, what stocks do you own individually? Mm-hmm. That would be that manager's high conviction stock. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So you want to look for managers that have. Again, I'm trying to point people in a direction rather than a specific recommendation. But you want to look for somebody that that's their strategy or style. Hmm. What, what I what I would say right now is, in one of the rules that says, don't invest in don't invest in formula strategies. And I'll give you, you know, we'll start picking on the formulas. One of the things that I've heard for years: subtract your age from 100, and that's the percentage that you should have in stocks. And the other part is the, what the other percentage of what you should have in bonds. Mm-hmm. I've heard that rule. Okay. Where did that come from? Somebody made it up. <laughs> you know, exactly. They made it up. There's no research that shows that that's the right thing to do. Uh-huh. And then when you stop and think logically is whether I'm 20 or 80, the market doesn't care how old I am. And it does just because I'm 80 doesn't mean a bond is a good investment, and just because I'm 20 doesn't mean stocks are a good investment right now. Yeah. So it's so it's just like it's sort of a nonsensical thing. And now that bonds are what two percent maybe. Yeah. And if they get any higher, that you know you got you got to take a lot more risk in it than you sh- than you should. So you know you probably shouldn't invest them anyway. But if bonds are two percent, why would I want a whole bunch of that stuff? Yeah. Yep. Because when interest rates went up from about eight to eighteen, when in like nineteen eighty one, eighty two, bonds were selling at fifty cents on the dollar. Hmm. And if I'm, and I was at that point, I mean, I'm, you know, when I'm, you know, in my thirties, 
actually low, very low 30s. Um, I, was, I mean, which is, I was 30. Mm. <laughs> so, it's like, so at that point, it's like, why, why would I want to be losing 50% of my money because I'm in bonds? So in other words, I, what I, I just, that, that's yeah. picking that one. So here's the other crazy thing is, is then in 19, in the 1990s when the market's roaring, the formula became subtract your age from 120. Oh, well, then they just altered it. That's cheating. Yeah, they just changed it because <laughs> we want to get you to buy more stocks. Jeez. <laughs> so, so anyway, that, that, that kind of picks one, one of the formulas. The other formula that's popular right now is in your 401k, is their target date funds or lifestyle funds. Again, it's basically taking your age and what percentage of bonds you're going to have. So you get into the older, you know, you know, in the earlier, you know, I only got 10 years to retirement, you get more bonds. And when I got 30, 40 years to retire, I get less bonds. Again, my age has nothing to do if this is a good place to put my money. Mm -hmm. Now I would, I'm going to go back to bonds. Back in the mid eighties, you could get treasury bills that were yielding 12%. Wow. Now, if I'm okay, let's do this. If I'm a you know a stockbroker or a stock or or a Wall Street guy in terms of invest, you know equities and in that that category, I don't want you to be going buy treasury bonds because I can be, I can buy a million dollars worth for twenty five bucks. So one guy and I actually I actually knew this guy. He retired. He had a uh, over a million dollar pension plan, but he could do a rollover, so he could roll over his his million. Let's say a million. He could roll over his million, and he could invest it and did in 30-year treasury bonds at 12% hmm. for the next 30 years, which is 65, puts him at 95, which is basically for the rest of his life. Yeah. For him to go and do, because, hey, I'm old, I should have more, you know, more, I should have a little bit in stocks, like, at that point, is like, I don't think so, <laughs> not when I can get 12% in bonds. Yeah. So that would be that would be another one is is again the formula investing. Now right now, and I'm going to describe it as the investment trend fad. I don't know what I, what it, what's the best way to describe it, but is for passive investing. And that's indexes, ETFs. Um, I would even put this in terms of the wrap accounts because essentially the wrap the wrap account or fee or oh, they changed the name to fee accounts. But basically, the fee accounts are: you take, you know, take your risk profile, and basically, which is basically, here's my risk profile, and here's your model portfolio, and here's where you invest. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not getting an individual portfolio; you're getting the model portfolio one, two, three, four, five. So your risk thing is: you get a one, he gets a three, and so then when I have all my model threes, I hit a button and change everything in model three. Should button hit change everything in model five? Change a button every model, model in, in, in one. And so you're really not tailored, the portfolio is not really tailored, tailored to the individual. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough. It's better than nothing, mm -hmm. but it's not the best way to do it. And right now, I believe there's over 2,000 exchange-traded funds. And all they are is mutual funds that can trade on the, on the exchange. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it right, you don't need, I mean, you can have a, the regular user fund that just closes, you know, at three o'clock of the day, and that's the price for for the day. You don't you don't need to be trading mutual funds, but that's that's kind of the whole index thing. And I think there's so much. Well, it's about seven to seven or eight to one in the money going to passive versus active. Um, I like the idea of Warren Buffett as he's looking to buy a good business. He probably only owns 10, 10 businesses. I mean, it tops maybe somewhere between at some time. 10 to 15 is, but he's buying good businesses. Yeah. He seems, he seems so, to be doing pretty well. Ex exactly. So that's, again, you can say, how do you find that? Look for that kind of manager. If you're, you know, going, you know, which is a good, good idea. If you look for that kind of manager is trying to find good businesses. Not Now, part of the passive investing is it's a lot easier to do that than it is to do all the hard work of research and study and, you know, and, and trying to find and research that good good business. Yeah, it's it it takes work. I mean, you you know, but the thing is, and this is my criticism of it. 
is this guy's working real hard doing all the research, and he charges, let's say, whatever he charges, let's say 1% per year. This guy's doing a passive investment, not doing as much research. He still charged me 1% per year. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they charge as high as one and a half. So if I if I have a passive investor and they're doing ETFs, I have to pay a fee to have the ETF managed. Then I have to have him pay him a fee to manage the to put the ETFs in some kind of formula, lifestyle fund or asset allocation, whatever it is. I'm not sure that I can justify. I, mean, I can't. What is he doing to earn one and a half percent per year? Mm -hmm. And then when you put the other manager, that let's say the ETF, and let's say they're charging a quarter to a half. No, I'm I'm getting close to one and a half to two percent just to have my money managed. Yeah, yeah. That's so. Again, if if it's passive, then you should be paying less. Yeah. Well, Dennis, we're really low on time. We're, we we got to wrap this podcast up. I know that right. every podcast we do, you really want to express the the one takeaway from the podcast. What would be your one takeaway from today's? Well, one thing I want, before we do that, I want to add one other thing. Sure. The, the most important thing here is find an advisor who knows you. Mm -hmm. I agree. If you, went to a, if you went to a doctor and he immediately handed you your, your prescription, and you'd go, hey, wait, you didn't do any medical history. <laughs> yeah. You didn't take any tests. Yeah. How can you do that? Or if you walk in and he says, open heart surgery. <laughs> Run. <laughs> you might think that's not a very good doctor. And I would say the same thing of financial advisors. You need to find somebody who knows you. Okay, realistically, let's, let's, let's point, point you in a direction. And this is, all, this is really, I think, the important thing. To point in a direction where I think that there's a, a good opportunity. And I think it's in the 5G area. As in, like, cell phones? Right, right now, for our cell phones, we're on, you know, 4G. Uh-huh. And, and, and the way I understand it, it might take you 17 minutes to download a movie, but if you're in 5G, it's going to take you six seconds. It's fast. And it can handle more than, like, if you're in a crowded place in a, and let, let's say you're at a stadium, everybody using their cell phone, the bandwidth can't, can't handle it, so it kind of slows everything down. Mm-hmm. My understanding is 5G within one square mile, I can handle a million phones. Wow. Yeah. So I think now, think of this way. I have, I have an iPhone, and uh, man, I, I really like it. But 5G came to Phoenix, Arizona. I can't use my iPhone. It doesn't have 5G capacity. Hmm. And think of all the phones out there that if you want to use, now I probably don't need it. I mean, I'm not watching movies and things like that. But lots of people like the game play, you know, I mean, they do things on their phone. They want the speed. Yeah. So if there's 100 million iPhones, they're going to have to buy, 100 million people are going to have to buy a new one. Or Samsung and, you know, everybody. I mean, so they're like, mm -hmm. now at the same time, all those towers that are getting the signal for 4G, they got to replace all that equipment. Yep. So I just, and it's just coming, just beginning. So I think. Is it? That's why I went back. I kind of use the example of Intel. Yeah. Buy the components that go in the phone and the components that get got to hang on the tower. Hmm. I, Interesting. So I, again, I'm you know I might be wrong, but this is my opinion. This is what I see. I think this is this is a, the direction where things are going. I'll yeah. tell you two things that I don't don't like. I am not big on this marijuana craze. I mean, it is a fad, one of the bigger fads I've ever seen in in my career. Okay. And the other one is I really don't like, but it may I may be really be wrong on this one, but I I don't like Bitcoin, hmm. you know the All cryptocurrencies, right. yeah, and anything that swings from eighteen thousand to six thousand, that's not for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Volatility is a is a huge issue, and, and you go right back to what you were talking about earlier with you know people doing risk profiles and and everything else. If you kind of stick to looking at buying good companies, that kind of eliminates a lot of that you know, a lot of that kind of guesswork, I would, I would, yes. I would assume. So, well, Dennis, I, I appreciate it. I think this was great. And I, I learned a lot because I, I truly believe you're, you're, you're spot on not looking at the larger company itself, uh, that is producing the computer, but what are the components going into it? And, 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 uh, I, I'm really intrigued now about 5g as well and kind of what the process is going to be for all these other companies to be able to incorporate that in, meaning they're going to have to start with the small components. So that'll be something I look into. 
Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, again, can you let people know how they can find you and, and, and learn more about you? I have a website, which is my name, DennisZetaraka.com. All right. It's as easy as that. Thanks again, Dennis. All right. And thank you all for listening to the Money Orchard Podcast with Dennis Zadareka. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Dennis comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at the Money Orchard, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. The Money Orchard symbolizes the portfolio, which is your money making money. When income from the orchard is the same as the income from your job, you are financially self-reliant. You have income sustainability because of your money orchard. Thank you for listening to the Money Orchard podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. TheMoneyOrchard.org.